Turn with me in your Bibles then to the Gospel according to Luke. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 37. Luke chapter 4, verse 31 through 37. Reading from God's holy word. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed, and they spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is, for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out every place in the surrounding region. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, this is your holy word, and now we pray that the spirit of truth who inspired the word in the biblical writers, it's all God breathed out, it's all truth. I pray that your spirit would convict us of this truth, apply it to our minds, hearts, and our wills. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Until now, in Luke 1, 1 to 4.30, Luke has focused on the person of Jesus as the incarnate Christ, the Son of God. In chapter 3, verse 22, remember the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's a declaration of Jesus' deity. And then the prologue, the extended prologue in Luke, the first three chapters, ends with a genealogy that declares the humanity of Christ. So who is Jesus? He is the incarnate Son of God. He's 100% God. He's 100% man, just like us, except he does not sin. He did not sin. Then, in chapter 4, 1 through 13, is the temptation of Jesus. And remember, that emphasizes his humanity. Jesus withstood the temptation of the devil. How did he do that? He submitted to the Father. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He knew the Scripture, and he quoted the Scripture. He had Scripture memorized. He set the example for us. And then in chapter 4, 14 through 30, he gives his first and last sermon in Nazareth. That's the beginning of his Galilean ministry. And Jesus also then openly declares that he is the Messiah. He is the Christ, the Savior. When he declares the acceptable year of the Lord, he declares the beginning of the Messianic age. Now, in chapter 4, 31 through chapter 5, we're in now, there's a new theme. He's revealed Jesus' authority, his power in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm. Over everyone, everything, including the unclean spirits, the demons, the devils, all religions, religious teachers, disease, nature, even death. As to the incarnate Lord, he has two natures, as we said, in one person. John MacArthur said Jesus had to be God to have the power to save us, but he also had to be man to have the privilege to be our sacrifice, our substitute. Friends, if Jesus is to save his people from their sins, as it says in Matthew 1, 21, he must have the power and authority over Satan and his demonic host to deliver his people from the kingdom of Satan and from their bondage in sin. In the book of Colossians, which stresses the supremacy of Christ, it says in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, He has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness. He's conveyed us into the kingdom of His Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It is precisely that power over the satanic realm that the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrates in this text today. So how do you and I evaluate the exercise of authority and power? Because different people exercise authority and power in different ways. The United States president, 
is considered to be the most powerful man in the world. And he exercises authority and power, he's supposed to, according to the U.S. Constitution, through proposing laws and using his veto power by being the commander-in-chief of our armed forces. A teacher exercises authority and power by passing out grades and sending the rebels down to the principal's office. A general exercises his authority and power via his stripes, giving out orders and prescribing military discipline. A CEO exercises authority and power by his issuance of company policies, by being over hiring and firing and being responsible for the bottom line. Traffic cops exercise their authority and power by the uniform that they wear, by the uniform that they wear, his gun and his badge, and by blowing his whistle at traffic intersections. An IRS agent exercises his authority and power be the official stationary that identifies him or her as an official tax person with statements such as this is to inform you that you are being audited for these tax years and for these reasons. We believe that you owe money, us money, and you've not complied with the law. You have 90 days to supply the following records and answers to the following questions or we'll confiscate your house, your car, your wife, your children, and we'll throw you into prison. Ultimately, what all these people and all others may or may not realize, friends, is this, that all of their authority and power is merely delegated. All of their authority and power is merely delegated, and it is all under the sovereign, absolute power of God. Romans 13.1 says, The powers that be are ordained by God. Only God has absolute authority. Daniel 4.35, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and none can say unto him, What are you doing? Where does Jesus fit into this picture? Does Jesus have real authority and power? If so, to what degree? Is his authority and power merely delegated, or is it absolute? Are we accountable to Jesus' authority and power? Do we even recognize his authority and power? My prayer this morning is that God's Spirit would illumine us to the reality of who Jesus is, his authority and power, and to our accountability to him. What does Jesus' authority say to us? The first point is, Jesus has speaking authority. Jesus has speaking authority, verses 31 and 32. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Jesus went down to Capernaum after he left Nazareth. His fame had spread. Capernaum means the city of Natham. Now, whether it's the Old Testament prophet Nahum, we don't know. But at least they repeatedly heard Jesus' teaching. You'll notice there that Sabbaths in verse 31 is in the plural. But if we read Matthew 11, 20 to 24, Capernaum is indicted by Jesus. Because Jesus told them, if all the wondrous works that had been done in your midst had been done in Sodom, Sodom would have repented long ago. And it would have been even worse for Capernaum because they heard the gospel repeatedly and did not respond to it. Friends, that's the same thing today. I think of my brother. My brother is just a couple of years younger than me. He has literally heard the gospel thousands of times in his life. Every time you hear the gospel and you do not respond to the gospel, your accountability before God increases. And if you persist in unbelief, what's going to happen is you will go to hell in your unbelief without saving faith in, faith in Jesus and you will receive a hotter hellfire. The residents of Capernaum that did not respond to Jesus repeatedly teaching and teaching them Sabbath after Sabbath, they will receive a hotter hellfire than those in Sodom. And Gomorrah. When you look at verse 31, it says he went down to Capernaum. The Bible is geographically accurate. Always remember that. 
The Bible is geographically accurate. If it says he went up, that means he went up in elevation. He went down, he went down in elevation. So when Jesus went from Nazareth to Capernaum, he went down in elevation, and he went down there to the northwest shores of the Sea of Galilee, where Capernaum, that fishing village, is located, and that became his ministry headquarters then. Instead of Nazareth, his hometown, which had rejected him, during his three and a half years of earthly ministry. We can go to Capernaum even today, and their archaeologists have discovered a synagogue there, the remains of which that dates back to the time of Jesus, and he may have even preached and taught in that very synagogue. You'll notice, as his custom was, there's Sabbath after Sabbath, chapter 4, uh, verse 16, his custom was he went into the Sabbath, or the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Jesus' custom was weekly worship. He worshiped every week corporately in the synagogue there with other worshipers. He attended public worship, and he leaves an example for each one of us. That's one of the reasons Jesus came was to teach, as this verse says here. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. Jesus came to preach. It says that in Mark 1.38. It also says in Luke 9.2, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he sent them out to preach and to cast out demons. The primacy was on the preaching. 1 Corinthians 1.21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world in its wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. That was the essence, remember, of the Reformation. They took the altar of the Roman Catholicism, put that aside, and they put the pulpit central. Preaching, teaching is central to our worship service. That is exactly opposite to the church growth movement today and the emergent church. In Ephesians 4.11, it says, God sent some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and pastor teachers. There's a hyphen in there. A pastor is to be also, he's to be an exhorter of the word of God, but he's also to teach the word of God. That word here, teach, Jesus taught them, didaskalon in the Greek means that he then gave them instruction from God's word. He gave them instruction from God's word. Now, what was the people's reaction then to Jesus' teaching? Look at verse 32. They were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. They were expleso in the Greek. It means they were amazed. They were shocked. But note, friends, this reaction is purely external. It does not indicate a heart change at all. No heart change at all. And why were they amazed? Because his words, it tells us in verse 32, had a ring of authority. Remember at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through, through 7, it says he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You remember in John chapter 7, the Sanhedrin was meeting and they sent out the temple police, go bring Jesus in here, we're going to deal with him. They went out and they heard Jesus preach, they came back empty handed and they asked him, how come you didn't bring Jesus here? And they exclaimed, no man ever spoke like this man. The word here for authority is exousia. Exousia. It's the same word in Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus says, all authority has been given on me in heaven and on earth. That's a Hebrew merism. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me over everything. A Hebrew merism takes two extremes to compass the whole. So heaven and earth, it means everything. Everything there and in between. Jesus has all authority. John 19, 11. Jesus is standing before Pilate. And what does Jesus say to Pilate? You'd have no authority over me at all unless it be given you from above. In Luke 12, 5. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he was killed has power to cast you into hell. Yes, I say, fear him. So exousia means an absolute right to act, a legal right to act. You have an absolute privilege to act, an absolute legal privilege to act. Ek is out of, and usia, one's being. So Jesus' power, authority to act just came right out of his being, his essence, his substance, who he was. 
And Jesus' speaking authority, it's interestingly enough, historically here in the historical context, was different than other rabbis. Why do we say that? Because it was traditional for rabbis of Jesus' day to add nothing, to add nothing of their own to the orthodox teachings they taught. It was customary either for the Pharisees, the scribes, or the rabbis to give their teaching and then to follow that up with merely quoting the rabbis who came before them, what the rabbis' sources had said, to substantiate then the, their own teaching that they had just presented. In many ways, that's nothing new under the sun. I, uh, I have a son that has a PhD piled higher and deeper. And what that means is that he has learned then how then to cite your references, to put footnotes in your writings and on your dissertations, to, to know what is acceptable research documentation. But friends, Jesus was different. His teaching came out of himself. It came out of his very essence or being. It was not superficial at all. It originated with him. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when people heard Jesus speak, they noted the uniqueness and the power of his words. There was a weightiness to Jesus' words like no other. And you and I would add, no other but God. So friends, what is our response to Jesus' words? You and I may have a red-letter Bible. There's approximately 750, 1,750 red-letter words in the Bible. And yet we don't stop there when it comes to Jesus' words. You remember when he was on the Emmaus Road, and he was speaking to the disciples there in Luke 24, 27. And Jesus began with Moses and the prophets, and he expounded them in the scriptures all things concerning himself. So all scripture speaks of Jesus. And we know from 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is theonoistis. It's God breathed out. Every word of God is true. Every word of this Bible is true. Reality is revealed by God, R.C. Sproul says. Or John MacArthur says, this is the self-expression of God. John 17, 17, in his high priestly prayer, Jesus says, sanctify them through your word. Your word is true. This is how we become like God or Jesus, is that we know God's word. This is truth. Sanctify them. Make them holy, Jesus says, through this truth, your word. What did Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. So friends, how do we view, view Jesus' commands and doctrine? Are they binding on us? Or are Jesus' words just like the emergent church says today? Oh, that's non-propositional revelation. What that means is, it's not God's words. It's up for us to decide whether it's part of the canon, the Bible, or not. It's, up, it's for us to decide whether it's weighty as God is weighty or not, whether it's binding or not. Friends, if you believe that, that this word is not God's word, then that is blasphemy against God. Why do I say that? Because Psalm 138.2 says God has magnified this word as his name, as his very being, as who he is, his glory, and his character. And we should always remember that if if we think that we can decide whether this is true or false merely on our human deliberations, Jesus said this in John 12, 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. What does Jesus' authority say to us? The first point is Jesus has speaking authority. The second point is Jesus has exorcising authority. Jesus has exorcising authority. Verses 33 through 36. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice. Saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Saying, be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in the midst, it came out of him. 
but I did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed, and they spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For what authority and power does he command the unclean spirits? And they come out. Rudolf Boltmann, who was a German liberal, died in 1973. He says, when you read these demon accounts in Scripture, they're all myths. They're all made-up fabrications of man. And friends, that's the other extreme. We have people today that say, oh, these texts are central to all of Scripture. They are the truths of Scripture. Demons exist today, and we need to, to, to be involved in demon exorcism, taking demons, calling demons out of people, because demons are everywhere. That's the other extreme. What, how should we respond to that? I respond is that demons exist today? Yes. Demonic possession in, of individuals exists today? Yes. The need for exorcism, just as in Jesus' day, exists today? Yes. But the difference is between our day and Jesus' day is that in Jesus' day, the divine activity with all the miracles that Jesus did and everything, the divine activity was ratcheted up. There was so much more of it present. And so what does Satan do? He ratcheted up the demonic activity to parallel that to counter it. And we've cited before from this pulpit, noting there are parallel times in history when the same things have happened. When you go through the Bible, in the beginning, in Genesis, at the time of the Exodus, at the time of the giving of the law, Elijah and Elisha, at the time of the first coming of Christ, and so it'll be at the, as we get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ, we'll notice the same thing, that as the, as the miraculous activity increases, as Christ is nearing, so will the demonic activity increase. When we look at this account in the Gospel according to Luke, this is the first of 21 miracle accounts in Luke that have either a Christological function pointing to who Christ is, or an eschatological function, pointing to the significance of the end times. Look at verse 33. In the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice. Now this man in the synagogue was demon-possessed. He had a devil that possessed him. He had an unclean spirit or an evil spirit. Those are synonyms of him. And friends, demons possess unbelievers only. Demons possess unbelievers only. It is impossible for a believer in Jesus Christ to be demon possessed. Colossians 2 6, as you have therefore received the Lord Jesus Christ, so walk in him. In a true believer, Jesus is on the throne. He possesses the believer. And we know that if Christ is in us, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. 1 John 4.4. 4. So it's impossible for a believer to be demon-possessed. But, and there's a but, a believer can be demon-oppressed. Demon-oppressed. And this can even be as chastisement or punishment from God. And who do we cite as the classic example in Scripture of that? Is the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. He was sent, because of all the revelations he had, there was an agent of Satan that was sent to buffet him. To buffet him. So that he would not have be of pride. And he prayed to God three times that he'd be delivered from that demon oppression. And what did God say to him? My grace is sufficient for thee. So then Paul says in conclusion, in conclusion therefore I'm most glad I will glory in my infirmities for when I'm weak, then I am strong. It's impossible, again I say, for a person who is truly in Jesus, in Jesus Christ, to be demon-possessed. But you can be demon-oppressed. Now, a real question that arises here also in this verse is what was this man, who was definitely an unbeliever then, and he was demon-possessed, what was he doing in the synagogue worship service among all the believers? And friends, we have the same thing going on in our day. The visible church is a mixture of tares and wheat, unbelievers and believers. Matthew 13, 25 to 43. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and then he went his way. 
And then the grain sprouted, produced a crop, and then the tares also appeared. And it says in Matthew 12, the church then, the professing church, until Christ's return will be a mixture of unbelievers and believers, professors and possessors of Jesus Christ. And those then, the tares and the wheat, will not be separated, it says in Matthew 12, until God, Jesus Christ, comes back, sends his angels out, and they will reap there the harvest, and those that are the tares will be burned in everlasting fire in hell. And also we could say it was this man's appointed time for deliverance. He was meant there to be there that day under God's sovereign plan. This is just like the Puritan's definition of seeking. Now our definition of seeking is for somebody to be actively hungering and thirsting after God's power, presence, or word. But the Puritans defined it differently. To be seeking was to put yourself in the way of the gospel. So they would say on the Lord's Day, would you rather have this unbeliever be in a, in a tavern or would you rather have him in the church meeting place being a seeker of the gospel? Which means he puts himself in the way of the gospel and the preaching of the word. Where is the greatest likelihood that he's to come to saving faith in Christ? Would it be in the tavern or would it be in the church meeting place among the believers? 1 Corinthians 14, 25 says, answers that. The unbeliever comes into the midst of the Corinthian believers and thus he falls down on his face and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest and he professes that God is truly in you. You see, he came to saving faith in Christ when he was in the assembly of the believers. Now you'll notice here, it says at the end of verse 33 that he cried out with a loud voice. The Greek there is megaphone. We get the English word megaphone from it. This was a scream, friends, a scream. I, I could demonstrate this, but I might scare you, so I won't. But it was a diabolic, blood-curtling, hair-raising screech. And it was caused by the sudden contact of that demon with Jesus. You see, they couldn't hold their terror in when Jesus appeared. And why such a violent reaction is answered in verse 34, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That word for know there in the Greek is oida. Oida. Different from gnosko. Gnosko means you add to your knowledge. Oida means there's a fullness of knowledge. There's a perception there. You know. It's the word in Revelation 2 and 3 Jesus says eight times to the churches, I know your works. And of course, Jesus is omniscient. He knows fully there. But these demons know fully exactly who Jesus is. Matthew 8, 29, the demon calls Jesus the Son of God. And later in John 6, 69, the disciples call Jesus the Holy One of God. And you'll notice they say here, did you come to destroy us? You see, the demons knew that the kingdom of God had come with Jesus coming to this earth. The today of chapter 4, verse 21. And the demons were being driven out in, uh, in 11, uh, Luke 11, verse 20. Jesus says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the Holy Spirit, then you know that the kingdom of God has come. And in Luke 10, 17 and 18, the 70 disciples returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And the demons knew that the abyss then was going to be their temporary abode. The abyss, what is it? It's a prison. It's a part, it's a holding cell. It's a part of Hades. Luke 8, 31. And they begged him that he would command them not to go into the abyss. That's a temporary abode of the demons, and the final abode of the demons will be the lake of fire. Matthew 25, 41. Then Jesus also will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, or the demons. Now notice in verse 34, it says, What have we to do with you? What does the we refer to there? There's a, there's a division between the scholars. Some say, well, that refers to the demon and the man. Others say that refers to a plurality of the demons. 
I come down on the side that says it refers to a plurality of the demons. You remember in Matthew 12, 43 to 45, the parable of the empty house? The devil went out of the man, and the man swept his being clean. And the devil went out, and he was looking for a place to reside, and he could not find any. So he went back to where it was originally, and he found the place swept clean and empty. So what did the demon do? He went out and got seven other demons more vile than himself, and they went in, and they entered into the man and possessed him. And the latter state of that man was worse than it was in the beginning. A multiple of demons possessed that man. Notice verse 35. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Rebuke. Jesus said sternly. You can remember. Remember when God created, he said, He spake and it was done. Psalm 33. It's just like Jesus. When he spoke sternly here and he rebuked him, the demon could not do anything else but obey that sovereign, authoritative voice of Jesus. And this is an, an explicit act of the absolute authority of Jesus as the Son of God over the demons. And you'll notice that this exorcism, it was marked by a violent act. It threw the man down, but then Luke adds, it did not harm him. Did not harm him. So Jesus healing this man was positive in nature. Look at verse 36. Then they were all amazed and they spoke among themselves saying, what a word is this? For with what authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. The people were amazed again, shocked, astonished, just like in verse 32. And remember, this is an external reaction. It does not indicate a heart change. You can have an exorcism. This man had the demon exorcised about him. You can hunt the scriptures all you want here. It does not say that that man came to saving faith in Christ because he had the demon exorcised out of him. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For if the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. Jesus cast out the demon through power. And that power came from chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. This power, what does this word mean here in verse 36? Authority, and then Luke adds, and power. The word there is dunamis. Dunamis. It's explosive, overwhelming, transforming power. It is the most powerful word for power that there is in the Greek language. I can't tell you how many scholars I've read over the years that say the dunamis power is dynamite. Jesus cast him out by his dynamite power. Friends, that's not it at all. I wish I had a quarter for every time I heard that fallacy. That's what's called an anachronism. An anachronism, you, it means that you take something that occurred later and then you write it back into the text. You can't do that. That's a falsehood. And you see, dynamite was not discovered until the latter uh, uh, eight, eight, 19th century by Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel of Nobel Prize fame. He was the Swedish chemist, engineer, and the innovator of dynamite. And he did not discover dynamite until the latter part of the 19th century. So the question is, did God's dynamite power raise Jesus from the dead? You and I say no. What raised Jesus from the dead is Psalm 33, 9. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The people of Capernaum were amazed when they saw the forces of hell tremble before Jesus. Needless to say, they'd never seen any exousia and dunamis like this before. So how about us? You and I read this text. Is it just old hat to us? Do we fail to put omnipotence with Jesus that it, he has all power, just as God has all power. And do we respond with godly fear in light of who Jesus is? Are we still amazed at the dunamis of the gospel? Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Did you know that a Christian evangelist went out 
And he asked the question of Christians. Why don't you share the gospel with unbelievers? And he got back all sorts of answers. Well, I'm scared. I'm fearful. Well, I'm so busy. I just have so many other things on my plate. I don't have time for that. Or I'm not gifted in evangelism. And the list of excuses went on and on. And you know what the num real reason is? The real reason why Christians don't share the gospel is that professing believers in Jesus Christ do not believe that there's power in the gospel to save. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. It is the dunamis of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do we extol and thank God for his great dunamis to us in saving us from the bondage of sin from which we as finite individuals were helpless to save ourselves? Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us were to believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that saves us from our sin. Do we marvel at that? Do we realize that is the power that resides in Jesus? What does Jesus' authority say to us? The first point is Jesus has speaking authority. The second point, Jesus is exercising authority. And the third point is Jesus has widespread authority. Verse 37. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. Friends, the fame of Jesus spread. We could cite, I won't take the time, but chapter 5, verses 15 through 17, chapter 6, 17 and 18, and climaxing in chapter 7, 17. The fame of Jesus kept spreading and spreading, but it reached a climax, and then it sunk like a weight on the end of a fishing line. Why did it do that? What happened is in John 6, 2 and 26, everyone was coming to see Jesus. They wanted to see this miracle man. He was the best show in town. Jesus says, I know why you came out to me, and I know why you want to make me king, because I fed you the bread and, bread and the fishes. But then, when it came in the bread of life discourse in John 6, 66 to 69, and Jesus had told them earlier that to, to follow me, you must eat of me and drink of me. There's a cost that you must take into account if you will follow me. And then it says in verse 66, John 6, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Friends, Jesus' fame would wane when the cost was counted to be his follower. Jesus said of his disciples in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, Take up your cross and follow me. And everybody in the first century knew what it meant to take up your cross because they knew of places like Golgotha. People went there to die. That's why, friends, I believe that the church is a remnant age. A remnant age. In Luke 18, 8, Jesus says, When I return, will I find faith? Here's a saying. Have you ever heard this before? Fame is a vapor. Popularity is an accident. And money takes wings. The only thing that endures is character. Do you know whose favorite saying that was? O.J. Simpson. Friends, there's many people that wear a face to hide their true identity. Just like this man who came into the synagogue that day with demon possessed. Everybody was there. They didn't know who he was. You see, he was wearing a face. But when he came face to face with Jesus... Then his true identity was exposed. John 2, 23 to 25, remember, there were many that wanted to commit themselves to Jesus when they saw the signs, but Jesus did not commit to them. Why? Because Jesus knew what was in man. He didn't have to have anybody tell him what was in man because he knew what was in man because he was God. He was omniscient. He could see and know all things. Hebrews 4, 13, neither is there anything that's not manifest in his sight but all things are naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And one day, friends, Jesus shall reign. And the secrets of every heart will be laid bare. 
as everybody stands before him in judgment. In Philippians 2.11, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord before the Father. Friends, Jesus came not for fame, but to save those with his name. Does that include you? Have you come to saving faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins? James 2.19, we went through this on Sunday night in our study. You believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. The devils believe in God and they tremble. True saving faith, what is it? True saving faith in Jesus, the, the Puritans used the acronym CAT. CAT. C-A-T. Consensus, consensus, and trust. Uh, consensus. You affirm that what the Bible says is true. Consensus. What the Bible says is true moves you emotionally, physically. It affects you. And then T is you put your trust in Jesus. Trust and obey. Now, you have to have all three of those for saving faith. The demons had the first two, but not the third. The demons believed in God. The demons trembled in the presence of Jesus. But they did not obey Jesus. And you see a hypocrite, a pretender, is a professor without obedience. And that was the man who was possessed of the unclean spirit. You see, if you do not have saving faith in Jesus, you will experience an everlasting destruction in hell, just like what these demons are headed for. What does Jesus' authority say to us? Three points this morning. Jesus has speaking authority, he has exercising authority, and he has widespread authority. Friends, in C.S. Lewis' classic book, Screwtape Letters, there's a senior demon, Screwtape, and he gives instructions to his apprentice demon, Wormwood, his nephew. And Wormwood has been given his first diabolic assignment to tempt and to spiritually destroy the victim assigned to him. But Wormwood's patient becomes a Christian, much to the chagrin, chagrin of screw tape. So the assignment of Wormwood does not end, but it changes its purpose. So instead of destruction, it's incapacitation. And in evaluating the pre presence of devils today, in the preface of screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis offers this valuable insight. He says this There are two equal and opposite heirs into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both heirs, and they hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Friends, our postmodern, relativistic, objective, truth-denying culture leans to that latter heir. Just think of all the plethora of movies and books that have come out about wizards, spirits, and alien beings. The lines between reality and fantasy have become blurred. It's much like in Martin Luther's day and his dealing with the peasants and dealing with those Roman Catholic, ignorant, doctrinally unsound clerics. The same thing. And today this commingling has entered into the professing anti-intellectual church and it creates much confusion about devils. In fact, many pastors have become absorbed with the demoniac, and they see demonic activity everywhere and in practically everywhere. And they delve into exorcism with both feet. In fact, my wife and I sat under a pastor in the Wilmer area that did such a thing, went whole hog into demonology and exorcism. And he had this consuming counseling ministry that ensued and what happened was his pulpit ministry waned and waned. Confusion resulted in a mentality that says, the devil made me do it. And what happens is the sin nature that remains in each and every one of us is excused. The devil does not make us sin. We, with that sin nature that still remains, we are responsible for our sinning. The unclean spirits, these demons, they can tempt us to sin, but we are responsible for yielding to the temptation and the actual sin. And the only way, 
that you and I can overcome the demons and their temptation is James 4, 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That order is very important. Submit to God first, then resist the devil, then the devil flees. You remember in Jude verse 9 when Moses was contending, I mean uh, Michael the archangel was contending with the devil about the body of Moses. And it says he dared not bring a reviling accusation against him, but he says the Lord rebuked thee. In the hierarchy of power you see Mike Angel, Mike, Michael the archangel is below Satan. But God is overall in power. So Michael the archangel said he submitted himself to God. He says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The only way to overcome sin for you and I is to recognize what sin is. 1 John 3, 4. It's a transgression of God's word, his law. John Piper says it's any attitude, action, or desire that explicitly breaks the commandment of God is done from a heart of unbelief or does not give glory to God. That is sin. And we acknowledge Romans 3.23, the universality of sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We acknowledge Psalm 51.4 as David did. Ultimately, all sin is against God. And in 1 John 1.9, we now acknowledge if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess is to acknowledge before God and others that we have done wrong. Os Guinness says confession involves three parts. An announcement. We know what is right and wrong from God's word. That's the announcement. Number two, the acknowledgement. Where we have fallen short. We have fallen short of God's word. And then what we, what we do is number three, an alignment. We repent. We make a 180 degree turn to the right. We repent of our sin and then we make a commitment to do what is right. Friends, that's biblical. And that puts the emphasis where it belongs. On Jesus, on his cross work for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of his people's sins. And we know that God accepted that sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus was resurrected from the dead. God put his stamp of approval on everything that Jesus did. And Jesus now is at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for all of us that plead to him for the forgiveness of sins. He's absolutely sovereign over all creation including Satan and his demons. Colossians. That book that the theme is the supremacy of Jesus Christ says this. In 1, 15 through 19. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things are created by him and for him. He's before all things. And by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, we just thank you for your word of truth. These are powerful words, dear Holy Father, from your scripture. I just pray that your spirit would convict us of the reality of these words, the truthfulness of them, and apply them. To each one of our minds, hearts, and our wills, dear Heavenly Father, these truths hold us accountable, dear Heavenly Father. We have heard the truth. Do we walk in the truth? Do we recognize who Jesus is, his authority? Do we recognize the way to overcome sin is only through his shed blood on the cross? We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that each one of us have set our eternal destiny in order, that we indeed have confessed our sins and known that Christ has forgiven them, his shed blood covers our sins, that he is our Savior and Lord. And then, dearly Father, by the filling of your spirit,